welcome. I'm Diane Herman, coordinator of the Speakers Bureau for the League of Women Voters of the Greater Dayton area. And today we're going to talk about the history of the 19th Amendment, which is the story of women's suffrage. And the story of women's suffrage is the story of one of the greatest social movements in American history. The sheer drama of the suffrage movement has few equals in our history. And while this story has been mostly overlooked in American history, one historian has written, quote, the struggle for women's voting rights was one of the longest, most successful, and in some respects, most radical challenges ever posed to the American system of electoral politics, end quote. As leaders of the movement, when the 19th Amendment was eventually added to the Constitution, guaranteeing the women the right to vote after over 70 years of hard work, Carrie Chapman Catt and Nettie Rogers Schuler stated about the protracted effort, quote, hundreds of women gave the accumulated possibilities of an entire lifetime, thousands gave years of their lives, hundreds of thousands gave constant interest and such aid as they could. It was a continuous, seemingly endless chain of activity. Young suffragists who helped forge the last links of that chain were not born when it began. Old suffragists who forged the first links were dead when it ended. It all started at a meeting of the World Anti-Slavery Convention in London in 1840. The Americans had sent a delegation, including women who were active in the abolitionist movement. When the convention ruled that only men be seated, among the women compelled to sit passively were Lucretia Mott and the young wife of an abolitionist leader, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The irony that women who were active in the great reform movements of the day were rebuffed and not allowed to officially participate led many, such as the Grimke sisters, who were gifted public speakers on the issue of slavery, to argue that the question of equality for women was not a matter of abstract justice, but must be undertaken so that women could be enabled to join in the urgent task of social reform, especially the fight to abolish slavery. It was in the abolitionist movement that women first learned to organize, to hold public meetings, to conduct petition campaigns, and finally to learn to advocate for their rights. So in 1848, Mott and Stanton and three other Quaker women decided to call a women's rights convention at the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls, New York, where Mrs. Stanton lived, to discuss the social, civil, and religious rights of women. There was plenty of lively discussion and many resolutions were introduced and passed unanimously, except for one, which was carried by only a small margin, being considered too radical at the time, the call for women to have the right to vote. Even Mrs. Mott felt that the proposal would make the women reformers look ridiculous, but some supported Mrs. Stanton, including Frederick Douglass, the great black abolitionist, who approved of Mrs. Stanton's daring proposal. Conventions continued to be held, but with the outbreak of the Civil War, all activities for women's rights were suspended, while efforts of the leaders of the women's cause were directed to the abolitionist issue. When the war ended and the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution were passed, abolishing slavery and extending the vote to black men, the suffragists felt betrayed when the right to vote was not extended to women. But they continued with their campaign, first seeking the vote on a state-by-state -state basis and then through a federal amendment. The suffragists used a variety of tactics over the years of their struggle to win the vote. One of their first focuses was on public education through speaking and circulating publications. They distributed literature to schools and libraries and sponsored debates. They had their own newspapers, Susan B. Anthony's The Revolution, and Lucy Stone's The Woman's Journal. They mobilized through women's clubs and, yes, even book clubs. They were great marketers. Thousands of banners, buttons, posters, sashes, postcards, and even Mother Goose nursery rhymes with the suffragist twist 
were used to publicize votes for women. Jack and Jill have equal will and equal strength in mind, but when it comes to equal rights, poor Jill trails far behind. They use symbols such as the herald, female figures in various forms, blowing a trumpet, holding a sword, carrying a torch, often coupled with sunbursts to portray a new day for women. Tableaus, which were theatrical demonstrations popular at the time, involved suffrage themes staged in public parks and alongside monuments. Colors of yellow to connote light and the role of women as enlighteners, white for purity and purple for loyalty and dignity were used in suffrage campaigns. There were also great parades, marches, and open-air meetings, the most impressive being the parade organized by Alice Paul in 1913 during President Woodrow Wilson's inaugural, featuring more than 5,000 suffragists spectacularly arrayed with costumes, banners, bands, floats, and led by the striking Inez Mulholland in flowing white robes on a white horse. In a strategy they call the new departure, they challenged the system through the courts. The suffragists argued that the newly enacted 14th Amendment said everyone born in the United States was a citizen. Therefore, as women were citizens, they had the same rights as men, including the right to vote. Acting on this argument, Susan B. Anthony and a group of women convinced men at the voter registration office to allow them to vote. After Anthony voted, she was arrested and tried in court for illegal voting in 1873. She was fined $100, a fine which she never paid. When a similar case made it to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1875, the court ruled that the vote is not a right of citizenship. As Anthony said, the laws, she said, are made by men, under a government of men, interpreted by men, and for the benefit of men. The only chance women have for justice in this country is to violate the law as I have done and as I shall continue to do. Alice Paul of the more militant wing of the suffragist movement in its later stages was one of the first Americans to employ new tactics of civil disobedience. Being the first, for example, to picket the White House for a political cause and after being arrested, arguing that she was a political prisoner and going on a hunger strike. She and her sister protesters were subjected to forced feedings, a brutal and dangerous procedure. The suffragists worked state by state to place women's suffrage on the ballot. They lobbied Congress and testified at hearings, dubbed by the press as the, quote, front door lobby because of the contrast between their open and honest methods and those more common among Washington lobbyists, the suffragists kept constant watch over members of Congress and continued to work hard to convince politicians to support women's suffrage. Women from all parts of the nation came in relays to reinforce those stationed at the National Organization's Washington headquarters. They studied congressmen with microscopic intensity, seeking the right words or arguments with which to persuade them to support the federal amendment. It had long since become clear to the suffragists that justice arguments alone would not be sufficient. Politicians had to be convinced that it was expedient for them personally, as well as for their party, to support women's suffrage. They traveled the country by car and train with the suffragists special, crisscrossing the nation, trying to gain support through publicity. They forged strategic alliances. The suffrage movement won a valuable ally when Francis Willard, as president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which sought to outlaw alcohol consumption, led thousands of otherwise traditional women to convert to the cause of women's suffrage as a way to protect the home, women, and children from the ravages of the drink. The progressive movement, which began around 1900 at the grassroots level and swept both national political parties, sought to advocate for reforms such as pure food and drug legislation, legal protection for workers, an end to child labor, and legislation to curb 
political corruption. Many progressives believe that women's vote would help obtain such reforms, such as the revered Jane Addams, founder of the famous Chicago settlement house, Hull House. They benefited from inspired leadership and applied huge amounts of effort with persistence and commitment. Carrie Chapman Catt recounted from the time the first woman's suffrage amendment was introduced in Congress in 1878, quote, over 52 years, women conducted 56 campaigns of referenda to male voters, 480 campaigns to get legislatures to submit suffrage amendments to voters, 47 campaigns to get state constitutional conventions to write women's suffrage into state constitutions, 277 campaigns to get state party conventions to include women's suffrage campaign planks in their party platforms, and 19 campaigns with 19 successive Congresses. Many were willing to sacrifice their resources and even their health by going to jail and engaging in hunger strikes. Some even died, such as Inez Mulholland, suffering from ill health, but who insisted on conducting a strenuous speaking tour, which resulted in her death from exhaustion and who became a martyr to the cause as a result. It is a testament to the suffragists that today's generations wonder that it took over 70 years for women to gain the right to vote in America. For many of us, it's a no-brainer. But this was a protracted struggle because the suffragists had so many obstacles to overcome. Their first obstacle was the traditional social role of women in the United States at the time. For the fight for the vote was also a fight to change the social, economic, and legal status of women. Women were perceived to be inferior to men and were relegated to the domestic sphere. In 19th century America, women were denied access to training and education, and they were prevented from receiving the same pay as men for similar work. Women also faced legal discrimination, especially if they were married. Women were unable to control their own earnings, manage property, or sign legal papers. Women's traditional role in the family meant that they were relegated to the private sphere of the home with responsibilities to run the household and care for the children in the days before labor-saving technology allowed time from mundane chores and before birth control allowed freedom from childbirth. This meant that women frequently lacked the resources of time, energy, and money to engage in pursuits outside the home. The definition of femininity meant that it was unladylike for women to pursue a career or engage in public activities, for this might mean the destruction of the family. Women's fragility meant that they should be shielded from the rough and tumble of politics. Those opposed to women's suffrage would claim that the suffragists were in favor of sex freedom, easy divorce, trial marriage, state care of children, birth control, and other destructive theories. If women won the right to vote, it would mean the destruction of the home and all of society. The suffragists expended much time and energy attempting to dispel these notions and to argue that women's suffrage would improve society as women would be advocates for change, such as good government, and yes, even be better mothers with the vote. Another obstacle facing the suffragists was that women are a heterogeneous, not a homogeneous group. Influenced by class, race, marital and educational status, religious and even regional, urban, and rural divisions. Women in the South were influenced by the very traditional and conservative values tied to enforcing white supremacy, and the Catholic Church and most other major religious denominations were clear in their rejection of women's suffrage. The values of the time concerning women's traditional roles and personal affiliations meant many women felt loyalty to their husbands, families, religious beliefs and communities, which fractured women from taking a united stand in favor of women's suffrage. Attempts to organize women meant overcoming ignorance, apathy, hopelessness, and the habit of submission 
in addition to working with a group which lacked resources, experience, and a cohesive identity as women. In addition, major institutions were aligned against women's rights, including religious groups, as we've said, political parties, major industries, especially the textile and garment industries, and most especially the liquor and saloon industries. The alliance of the suffragists with the temperance movement resulted in the arousing of a powerful opponent in the liquor industry, which saw women voting as a threat to be stopped at all costs. Many believe that this group's powerful manipulation of American politics long delayed the coming of women's suffrage. And any time we look at historical change in America, the issue of race emerges as a divisive one. While the suffrage movement had historically been aligned with the rights of blacks and the abolishment of slavery, white female suffragists increasingly became indignant that black men won the vote ahead of them and angry at the ease with which immigrant men were enfranchised. In fact, the issue of race became so problematic in the suffrage movement that it led to a split in the movement shortly after the end of the Civil War with Stanton and Anthony arguing against the adoption of the 15th Amendment and forming the National Women's Suffrage Association, and Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell supporting adoption of the black male vote, as this was now the Negro's Hour, and forming the American Women's Suffrage Association. In 1890, the two groups reunited to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association, also known as NASA. At this point, the suffragists felt that they would need the support of the southern states if they were to be successful with the federal amendment to the Constitution. With the renewed ascendancy of white supremacy in the South after Reconstruction, the suffragists began to use a strategy first suggested by Henry Blackwell a prominent abolitionist and husband to Lucy Stone, they argued that women's suffrage, far from endangering white supremacy in the South, could be a means of restoring it. They suggested that the adoption of women's suffrage with educational or property qualifications would disqualify most black women and would allow the South to restore white supremacy in politics without having to disenfranchise black males and risk congressional repercussions. The NASA spent considerable time and resources developing this Southern strategy, sending their leaders on speaking tours throughout the region and holding the 1895 NASA convention in Atlanta and even asking their aging hero, Frederick Douglass not to attend for fear of offending their Southern hosts. But pitting one group against another seldom works in either's interest, and it soon became obvious that Southern politicians were not persuaded to destroy women's traditional role as they proceeded to institute Jim Crow laws to block black male voters' access to the ballot. And despite white suffragist exclusion of African American women from white suffragist organizations, many prominent African Americans actively supported women's suffrage from its very beginning, such as the former slave Sojourner Truth with her famous Ain't I a Woman speech at one of the first conventions to Ida B. Wells, famous as a leading crusader against lynching, and Mary Church Terrell, educator and first president of the National Association of Colored Women. Adela Hunt Logan, Tuskegee faculty member, insisted that if white women needed the vote to protect their rights, then black women, victims of racism as well as sexism, needed the ballot even more. Class divisions were also apparent in the movement. Many upper class men and women opposed extending the vote to women. As guardians of the status quo, they perceived the suffragist movement as a threat to social stability, an attack on the family and women's traditional roles. Unfortunately, many suffragists of white middle class origins also expressed anti-immigrant sentiments, 
arguing that educated white women were more deserving of the franchise than ignorant lower class immigrant males who frequently voted against suffrage. Some suggested that the votes of native born white women could counter the foreign menace and that an educational qualification for voting would disenfranchise unfit voters. But eventually, the obstacles of women's traditional roles, powerful interests, religious objections, political parties, race, and class were overcome, and the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was ratified in August 1920. It states, quote, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The exact wording drafted by Susan B. Anthony in 1878. And the suffragists have still not gone away. They've just morphed into the League of Women Voters. Formed out of the suffragist movement by the last leader of the national organization, Carrie Chapman Catt in 1920, who saw that now that we have the vote, what are we going to do with it? Make sure that our democracy is protected by encouraging and engaged and informed citizenry the mission of the League. And yet, while we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the beginnings of the League of Women Voters from which the struggle to win the vote emerged, American history is a little more complicated. White women did win the vote in 1920. But in fact, almost all women of color were not enfranchised by the 19th Amendment. For black women, especially in the South, they were blocked from voting by the institution of Jim Crow laws after the failure of Reconstruction in the 1870s. It would not be until the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965 that African Americans gained access to the ballot in the South. The Indian Citizenship Act was passed in 1924, but Western states, especially Montana and South Dakota, have continued to erect barriers to Native American voters. Chinese Americans were granted citizenship and the right to vote in 1943. Other Asian Americans were not entitled to vote until 1952, when the McCarran-Walter Act overturned the Asian Exclusion Act of 1924. For Hispanic Americans, the struggle to achieve voting rights began with the Guadalupe Hidalgo Treaty in 1848, which ended the Mexican-American War. Mexican Americans faced similar nullification of voting rights as blacks in the South, with local laws requiring English proficiency tests and property requirements, in addition to local vigilante violence. It wasn't until the renewal of the Voting Rights Act in 1975 that language barriers were addressed. And let's not forget the citizens of Washington, D.C. and the U.S. territories Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and Guam who are not entitled to the vote. So the work of the suffragists to secure the vote for more of our citizens continues as the League of Women Voters addresses barriers to voting, such as making registering to vote more difficult by limiting Department of Motor Vehicle offices in rural, poor, and minority communities, requiring difficult to obtain state-issued voter identification, limiting early voting, discouraging voting by mail, restricting access to absentee ballots, providing few polling locations resulting in long lines to vote, and purges of voter rolls, to mention a few. The vote is the foundation of democracy, but it is a right that has to be continuously defended.